Hello, I'm Tom Kimmel, and Admiral Kimmel's grandson. The Board for Correction of Naval Records has agreed to hear my application for administrative action in the Rear Admiral Kimmel matter. And they did so on April 26, 2018, this past April. I have requested to appear before the board and make a presentation. Here before you is a one-page summary of my presentation to the board. What follows is my full presentation. Both will be made available to the board. The Admiral Kimmel matter has been called the most tragic injustice in American military history. As I quoted, thank you for the opportunity to explain. Here is the man who said it, the former Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, when he was a senator from Delaware. The Kimmel and Short matter is the most tragic injustice in American military history. Recently, he autographed a book, A Matter of Honor, by Anthony Summers and Robert Swan, where he underscored that indeed it is a matter of honor and counseled us to keep the faith. Consider, number one, Unlawful command influence, the mortal enemy of military justice, runs rampant throughout the Kimmel matter. And it started immediately with the executive order by President Roosevelt on December 18, 1941. In pertinent part, the purposes to the Roberts Commission were spelled out by the president. Provide bases for sound decisions. Find out whether any derelictions of duty or errors of judgment on the part of the Army or Navy personnel contributed to the enemy's success. And if so, what those derelictions or errors were and who were responsible therefore. In other words, Find someone to blame. Compare that aim with that of the 9-11 Commission. The chairman and the vice chairman in the joint statement said that their aim has not been to assign individual blame. And indeed, they did not. However, in the Pearl Harbor matter, they engineered an official thesis of guilt. From December 1941, when the decision was made to relieve the two commanders of their duties in Hawaii, until February of 1942, when their retirement under a stigma of guilt was publicly announced, the case was under advisement and consideration by the administration. The following high officials took part in making the decisions and devising the formulas of public announcement. President Roosevelt, Secretary of War Stimson, Secretary of the Navy Knox, Chief of Staff General Marshall, Attorney General Bedell, General Kramer, the Judge Advocate General, and General J.H. Hildring, Assistant Chief of Staff. Kimmel's attorney, Charles Rugg, met Justice Roberts soon after the Naval Court of Inquiry ended to discuss its findings. Charles Rugg wrote, Justice Roberts expressed indignation at the treatment that had been given Admiral Kimmel and General Short and said in substance that when the report was handed to the president, he mentioned the propriety and advisability of giving both prompt military trials and that 
While he could not quote the president specifically, he replied definitely that he had been given every assurance that trials would be had promptly, and by promptly, he was given to understand during the spring of 1942. Rugg's complete memo is on my website and is also at the link provided on this slide. Members of the Washington High Command provided false testimony and false evidence, which was irreparably prejudicial to Kimmel. Here's the dark heart of the Roberts matter. When the members of the Roberts Commission were advised by the highest ranking officers of the Navy that Admiral Kimmel had the same vital information available from the intercepted Japanese messages which they had in Washington, D.C., such representations were false. Whether this false information was supplied as the result of incredible internal confusion or design, it did Admiral Kimmel irreparable prejudice. Captain Wilkinson's statement that, nevertheless, warning dispatches had been sent out suggests that the warning dispatches were merely an unnecessary redundancy. <clears throat> Admiral Turner testified to the Naval Court of Inquiry. Question number 158 by the Naval Court of Inquiry. Do you recall expressing before the Roberts Commission, Admiral Turner, any belief that the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Kimmel, was perfectly familiar with all of the intelligence information, including the special intelligence to which reference has been made in this testimony? Admiral Turner, I don't recall specifically making that statement, I probably did, because that was my belief. With Admiral Turner's admission, it's clear that the heads of Navy operation and intelligence both gave the Roberts Commission the deplorable misinformation that Kimmel had the same information in Hawaii as they had in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> Number three, members of the Washington High Command withheld exculpatory evidence from Kimmel, denying him the means to defend himself. <clears throat> Kimmel did not find out about magic until 1944. So what is the most relevant fact of the entire post-Pearl Harbor inquiries? Magic. Magic and intelligence is undoubtedly the most relevant fact of the entire post-Pearl Harbor inquiries. As Admiral Kimmel said, we needed one thing in Hawaii, which our own resources in Hawaii could not make available to us. That vital need was magic available in Washington, which told when and where Japan would probably strike. He did not get this information. In 1941, the Roberts Commission had Secretary of the Navy Knox's report but Kimmel did not. It read, neither Short nor Kimmel at the time of the attack had any knowledge of the plain intimations of some surprise move made clear in Washington through the interception of Japanese instructions to Nomura, in which a surprise move of some kind was clearly indicated by the insistence upon the precise time of Nomura's reply to Secretary of State Cordell Hull at 1 o'clock p.m. on Sunday afternoon. But instead of telling the public that Kimmel was not alerted, as he had reported to President Roosevelt, the Secretary of the Navy the next day merely told the press that Kimmel was not alert. So it went from Pearl Harbor not being alerted, to not being alert, to being asleep when the press had the chance to take it up a notch. <clears throat> and there was more. A general warning 
had been sent out from the Navy Department on November 27th to Admiral Kimmel. General Short told me that a message of warning sent from the War Department on Saturday night at midnight before the attack failed to reach him until four or five hours after the attack had been made. And still more. Of course, the best means of defense against an air, air attack consists of fighter planes. Lack of an adequate number of this type of aircraft available to the Army for the defense of the island is due to the diversion of this type before the outbreak of war to the British, the Chinese, the Dutch, and the Russians. <clears throat> On January 9th, 1941, there was received in the Navy Department Lieutenant Commander John Oppie's Toronto raid chart indicating that the British on November 11th, 1940 successfully airdropped torpedoes on the Italian fleet in 18 to 22 feet of water. This is the raid chart submitted to the Office of Naval Intelligence on January 9th, 1941. Clearly showing by these T symbols where the torpedoes were dropped as they were heading for the battleship Comte de Cabor. This fact was not only denied Kimmel, but remained hidden from all Pearl Harbor investigations. Ditto. Lieutenant Morehouse's report. On July 22nd, 1941, there was received in the Navy Department a report dated July 15th, 1941, that the British could successfully airdrop torpedoes in 24 feet of water. Kimmel was not told, nor once again was any Pearl Harbor investigation apprised of this fact. In the report, records of the Royal Navy, Mark 12, indicate that this torpedo can be dropped in water as shallow as four fathoms. That's 24 feet. Also denied, Kimmel. Popoff spy questionnaire indicating interest in the water depths at Pearl Harbor and whether torpedo protection nets were in use. It is my contention that if Popoff's questionnaire had been sent to Kimmel, which it most definitely was not, Pearl Harbor investigators would have bludgeoned him with it. Not only was it not sent to Kimmel, it was completely unknown to any Pearl Harbor investigation. Arbor officer Von der Osten's spy report was also denied Kimmel, even though in cursive on the spy report, it indicated that this will be of interest mostly to our yellow allies. Number four, members of the Washington High Command told the Roberts Commission that Kimmel had the same information in Hawaii as they had in Washington, D.C. To have blatant untruth, the Washington High Command, knowing full well what they had done, had an obligation to immediately rectify the prejudice. They did not do so. In a contemporaneous writing explaining his testimony to the Roberts Commission that very day, the director of the Office of Naval Intelligence, Admiral Wilkinson, wrote to the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Stark, that Kimmel had as much information in Hawaii as we had in Washington, D.C. The Roberts Commission meeting was discussing magic freely. <clears throat> Number five, immediately after the Roberts Commission, members of the Washington High Command manipulated Kimmel into retirement against his will and schemed to preclude any further investigation of Pearl Harbor. 
on January 26, 1942, three days, just three days after the conclusion of the Roberts Commission, members of the Washington High Command manipulated Kimmel into retirement and tried to avoid any further investigation of Pearl Harbor. From this memo before you, written three days after the Roberts Commission, it's clear that Chief of Staff Marshal Secretary of War Stimson, Chief of Naval Operations Stark, and the Judge Advocate General recognized the danger of further Pearl Harbor investigation and devised a way to avoid it. Limit investigation to the Roberts Commission, avoid a naval court of inquiry at all costs, and manipulate Kimmel and Short into retirement. From Marshall's memo before you, it's apparent that he, Stimson, Stark, and the Judge Advocate General all agree the Roberts Commission was on a plane above that of a Naval Court of Inquiry and therefore rendered a Naval Court of Inquiry unnecessary and to be refused if a Naval Court of Inquiry was requested. The same day, Admiral Stark ordered Kimmel notified of Short's retirement decision in hopes that Kimmel would likewise apply for retirement against his will. Anthony Summers and Robin Swan discovered this transcript in the Nimitz papers, in the Admiral Nimitz papers at the Naval History and Heritage Center, a remarkable find for their 2016 book, a matter of honor. Here's the transcript. Vice Admiral Randall Jacobs, Chief of the Bureau of Navigation and Personnel, and Vice Admiral John Wills Greenslade, Commandant, San Francisco, and a friend of Admiral Kimmel's. Admiral Jacobs, has Kimmel returned yet? Greenslade, yes, he's here. Jacobs, I have just been discussing the matter with Admiral Stark, and they want Kimmel kept in a leave status until further disposition is made of the Roberts report. I was asked by Admiral Stark to inform you to tell Kimmel that General Short has applied for retirement. Greenslade, in leave status? You want me to tell him that? Yes. Before this suggestion, Admiral Kimmel had not considered retirement, expected, and stood ready to be reassigned. Number six, the Roberts Commission falsely declared that Kimmel was solely blamable for the success of the attack and that the Washington High Command fulfilled their obligations. Recall, Attorney Ruggs meeting with Supreme Court Associate Justice Owen Roberts. Judge Roberts expressed astonishment at what he termed the magic messages and said that all that his commission was told of concerning information of this character was the message received on December 7, 1941. <clears throat> he also added that either the commission was told directly or definitely given to understand that that was all the information pertinent to Pearl Harbor that was available in the Navy Department. He said that the findings that they had made as to the propriety of action of high-ranking officials in Washington, D.C. was predicated on that. Number seven. The Washington High Command discussed magic freely with the Roberts Commission in 1941 when an impression could be left that Kimmel had magic. But in 1944, when that was no longer possible, the Washington High Command declared that magic could not be discussed with the Naval Court of Inquiry or the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Director of the Office of Naval Intelligence, Admiral Wilkinson. Kimmel had as much information as we had. The Roberts Commission meeting was discussing the magic freely. Safford. 
Captain Lawrence Safford, the head of Op 20G, the head of Naval Communications Intelligence, indeed the revered father of Naval Communications Intelligence, revealed magic to the heart investigation. But the Navy Department refused to provide Hart's investigation to the Naval Court of Inquiry. Accordingly, magic was not made known to the Naval Court of Inquiry for over a month into its proceedings. Meanwhile, Chief of Staff Marshall denied magic information to the Army Pearl Harbor Board, which only learned of its existence from Admiral Kimmel's Army Pearl Harbor Board testimony. Number eight, the Chief of Staff of the Army perjured himself before the Army Pearl Harbor Board and ordered his subordinates to do so as well. Before we consider this slide, let's consider this story about Marshall's 1944 interview with 60 war correspondents in Algiers. I quote, The door opened. A hush fell. General Marshall walked in. He looked around the room, his eyes calm, his face impassive. To save time, he said, I'm going to ask each of you what questions you have in mind. His eyes turned to the first correspondent. What's your question? A penetrating query was put. General Marshall nodded and went on to the next man, and so around the room until 60 correspondents had asked challenging questions, ranging from major strategy to technical details of the war on a dozen fronts. General Marshall looked off into space for perhaps 30 seconds. Then he began. For nearly 40 minutes, he spoke. His talk was a smooth, connected, brilliantly clear narrative that encompassed the war. And this narrative, smooth enough to be a chapter in a book, included a complete answer to every question we had asked. But what astounded us most was this. As he reached the point in his narrative which dwelt upon a specific question, he looked directly at the man who had asked the question. Afterward, I heard many comments from the correspondents. Some said they had just encountered the greatest military mind in history. Others exclaimed over the encyclopedic detail Marshall could remember. All agreed on one thing, that's the most brilliant interview I have ever attended in my life. So wrote Frederick Payton for Reader's Digest in January of 1944. With that in mind, let's get back to the slide. General Marshall famously was asked where he was the evening of December 6th when his only boss, the commander-in-chief, was reading a secret communication from the enemy and declaring this means war. General Marshall famously uh, replied to where he was Saturday night, December 6th, that he couldn't recall. He was asked that many times. He couldn't recall many times. They asked him where he was Sunday morning because there was still plenty of time to get a warning message, an alert message to the armed forces worldwide, which was his premier responsibility. His recollection was unclear, no independent recollection. Investigators now frustrated asked him, well, you don't know where you were Saturday night, not unclear of your movements on Sunday morning. Where were you, General? when you actually got the word that Pearl Harbor was under attack. General Marshall's response was he did not know where he was. 
And of course, you can find that in Volume 3 of the Joint Congressional Committee's Pearl Harbor Attack Volumes at page 1,109. I like to contrast that with Winston Churchill's answer as to where he was when he got the word that Pearl Harbor was under attack. His answer was he was at his country home in Checkers and satiated with satisfaction and emotion. He went to sleep and slept the sleep of the saved and the thankful. We continue. Marshall, according to his champion, Colonel Henry Clausen, that's his champion, not his critic, his champion, Henry Clausen, recorder at the Army Pearl Harbor Board, wrote, Marshall caused perjured testimony to, presented, to be presented to the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Marshall had ordered his subordinates to lie to the Army Board, and they had complied. Indeed, General Miles, the head of Army Intelligence, signed an affidavit to that effect. Generals Osmond and Clark transmitted to me instructions from General Marshall that I was not to disclose to the Army Pearl Harbor Board any facts about magic. Evidence of subordination of perjury doesn't get any clearer than this, which in turn led to this. Army Pearl Harbor Board uh, member General Henry Russell wrote, I was convinced that no agency of the War Department could have been as inefficient and downright stupid as the office of G2 desired the Army Pearl Harbor Board to believe it to have been. Lastly, General Wittemeyer, my confidence in Marshall's integrity, his loyalty to principles and friends had been shaken but not destroyed by the testimony he gave before the Army Board investigating Pearl Harbor. No doubt I had been naive. Number nine, the chief of naval operations perjured himself before the Naval Court of Inquiry. Admiral Stark, before the Joint Congressional Committee, was asked where he was Saturday evening, December 6, 1941. He said he did not recall. Nobody reached him. He was asked the same question the next day, same answer. Did not recall. He's under oath, of course. In May, the Joint Congressional Committee shut down its operations, began to write their report. A week after that, Admiral Stark's flag lieutenant, Captain Crick, came to Admiral Stark and said, Admiral, don't you remember where you were? You were with me, sir. You were with me and our wives. Saturday evening, December 6th, we went to the National Theater. We saw a viewing of student prints. <coughs> After the performance, we retired to your quarters. Uh, the houseboy greeted you, told you that the President of the United States had called and wanted you to call him right back. You excused yourself, went to the library, came back shortly thereafter, said you had been discussing the critical situation in the Pacific with the President of the United States. Admiral Stark, between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, went back to the Joint Congressional Committee told them of what Crick had said, the Congressional Committee between Iraq and a Hard Place, reconvened the Joint Congressional Committee's investigation and took the testimony from Captain Crick and also from Admiral Stark. Admiral Stark, in effect, said, Crick's testimony notwithstanding, I still do not remember where I was December 6th, Saturday evening, the night before the attack. This prompted Congressman Gerhardt to ask Admiral Stark, Admiral Stark, could you have been with General Marshall since he can't remember where he was Saturday evening, December 6th, 1941, either. In 1979, John Tolan interviewed Mrs. Crick, and she pretty much confirmed 
her husband's testimony. All through 1941, Admiral Stark recorded nearly every telephone conversation he had in his office with President Roosevelt, Secretary of State Cordell Hull, and others unknown. But he did not reveal this fact to any Pearl Harbor investigation, then or ever, in spite of numerous promptings to do so by the Naval Court of Inquiry and the Joint Congressional Committee. In 1981, one of Admiral Stark's seven naval aides wrote his reminiscence, published it. In pertinent part, it said, I, Admiral Snedberg, kept a wax cylinder record of everything the president said to Admiral Stark. The president would call up and say, Betty, a nickname for Admiral Stark, I want this done right away. And he'd give five or six things in rapid fire order. The admiral would say, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President, yes, Mr. President. Have you got that, Betty? Yes, Mr. President. And he'd hang up. The buzzer would ring, and I'd go in to hear Admiral Stark say, did you get all that, Snetty? Yes, sir. We'll get going on it. I monitored nearly every conversation Admiral Stark had, and I made a record of almost all of them. Every now and then, when it was a personal thing, Admiral Stark would tell me to destroy the record. On August 9, 1944, when the Naval Court of Inquiry asked Admiral Stark if he ever kept any record of his conversations with the President during the year 1941, he lied. Naval Court of Inquiry, question number 388. Did you, Admiral Stark, ever keep any record of your conversations with the President during the year 1941? Admiral Stark's answer, no, I did not. And that's not all that Stark lied about. He also recorded conversations between Admiral Stark and Secretary of State Cordell Hull. Hull called Stark and asked and said, Admiral, I'm afraid the fat's in the fire. It's up to you military fellows now. I, Admiral Smedberg, heard the conversation. It was on one of those wax cylinders I broke up. Now I wish I hadn't destroyed them. Consider Stark's statement to the Joint Congressional Committee on January 2nd, 1946, concerning Cordell Hull, Secretary of State Cordell Hull's November 26, 1941 American note. Stark, of course, had said he uh, had never seen that American note, had the slightest recollection of the note. But here's what he told the Joint Congressional Committee. In a question from uh, Counsel Gazelle, Admiral Stark, the evidence here shows that that note, November 26, 1941, was intercepted in the regular course and was among the Japanese intercepts. In other words, the text of the note being transmitted by the Japanese representatives here in Washington back to Tokyo. Admiral Stark, that is true. I think that was on the 28th. Gazelle, do you think you saw it then on the 28th? Admiral Stark, you could not be sure. I would like to say with regard to that 10-point note, while not recollecting having seen it at that time, that I had discussed in the State Department a memorandum by Mr. Morgenthau and expressed my opinion on it and confirmed it in writing. 
the note of the 26, the 10-point note, as I recall, contained nothing or at least very little or only minor differences from the note of the Secretary of the Treasury and also did not contain anything which I had objected to in the other note. So in general, I knew of the substance of that note. But as to having seen it in its actual form when it went out or whether I saw it on the 28th, I could not say. Number 10, the Chief of Naval Operations destroyed evidence. Need I say more? Number 11, the War and Navy Departments intimidated witnesses before and after the Naval Court of Inquiry and the Army Pearl Harbor Board. If you provide false evidence and false testimony to falsely prove someone guilty of a crime, what are you doing? Well, Captain Safford clearly thought Marshall and Stark were trying to frame Kimmel and Short and so testified to that fact. Efforts to intimidate Safford to change his testimony failed. In 1980, Ralph Briggs, Commander Ralph Briggs, wrote an affidavit admitted receiving the Wins execute message, said he was ordered not to testify about it to the Joint Congressional Committee. The Joint Congressional Committee con concluded in 1946 that the Wins execute message was never received by American intelligence. Safford refused to identify Briggs as the recipient of the Wins execute message. How's this for intimidating witnesses? Colonel Clausen wrote that he was acting like an FBI agent, which of course has great interest to me. Clausen wore a bomb to conduct Pearl Harbor interviews in the war zone. Rather than go through the time consuming process of calling witnesses back to Washington, I will become a walking bomb. If it malfunctioned, it would incinerate me in a flash. In a war zone, the bomb must always be armed. So how come Kimmel and Short did not receive magic? Colonel Rufus Bratton was the head of the Far East Section of the Army's Military Intelligence Division. Bratton, under oath, was asked, who told you who was to receive magic? Bratton's response, Marshall told us in August 1941 exactly who was to be given magic. Everyone on the list was in Washington, D.C. General Marshall, also under oath, was asked the same question. I did not know that magic was being withheld from Hawaii. On the distribution of magic, I gave no specific instructions that I recall. Well, be that as it may, it is indeed unfortunate that William Friedman, the man who broke purple, the man who broke into magic, was ordered not to publicly share his insights, which were remarkably similar to Captain Safford's. Senators Ferguson and Brewster, in their minority rep report, say even if the wind execute message they saw was a false one, they believed it true at the time and should have acted accordingly. A good point, and I think one that should be emphasized. 
It is too bad it wasn't followed up regardless of any other considerations. He continues. <clears throat> he continues with his brochure, he called it. After studying Tokyo Dispatch number 183, the bomb plot message, no military intelligence organization could fail to reach the deduction that it was to prepare the detailed plan for a surprise attack on the major units of the fleet moored there. Here, I think, is the kernel of the nut, the secret of why the U.S. was taken by surprise. I have underlined the phrase, no military intelligence organization, in the foregoing extract from Admiral Theobald's book, page 46, because I think that our military and naval intelligence organizations had serious defects at that time, and I think they still do. I think that serious defects in our military and naval intelligence made it possible for the Japanese to take us by surprise at Pearl Harbor. A strong statement? Yes, but I think it is warranted. I think that Kimmel and Short were not as culpable as I first thought they were in 1941-42. The Washington authorities were culpable too, maybe a lot more culpable than were these two officers. I think that Kimmel and Short should have been sent more information, even if they were sent only gists of magic, to let them evaluate for themselves the significance of what the Japanese were saying. General Miles, the head of Army Intelligence, says that the warning messages sent them were of far more importance than anything they could have got from magic. I don't agree. Today, in 1957, I think they, the minority of the Joint Congressional Committee, hit closer to the truth than the majority. I think Mr. Keith's additional views on the majority report made good sense. Kimmel and Short, he said, were not the sole culprits. I think that the intelligence services came off rather easily, too easily, in the fixing of responsibility and pointing out derelictions. I think that Admiral Stark was wrong in waiting for General Marshall to be found before sending off a message to Kimmel and Short and to the overseas commands. As soon as the last part of the 14-part Tokyo to Washington message became available, especially when he knew from magic that Kurushu and Nomura were told exactly to the minute when to present the whole message to Secretary Hall. Today, General Samford, the head of NSA, phoned me to say that he did not think it advisable to publish the brochure at all. I accepted this decision without question. The Naval Court of Inquiry virtually exonerated Admiral Kimmel in 1944 but the Navy Department refused to reveal this fact for over a year, thus denying Kimmel the public justice that the Navy's own system accorded him. Immediately after Kimmel's counsel, Charles Rugg, found out about the Naval Court of Inquiry's report, he sent this telegram the Secretary of the Navy Forrestal, I quote, I request immediate release of findings of Navy Court of Inquiry as to innocence or guilt of Admiral Kimmel. For nearly three years, he has borne public blame for Pearl Harbor disaster. He has requested and been denied court-martial. His treatment has been un-American. In your letter to Admiral Murphan, released to press on October 20, you intimate that facts now three years old found by Navy court may be withheld as secret or top secret on ground disclosure would interfere with war effort. Certainly, 
release of findings of court as to Kimmel's innocence or guilt cannot affect war. Past injustices cannot now be remedied. Simple justice and common decency require immediate public announcement of court's findings as to Kimmel's innocence or guilt. <clears throat> On December 7, 1944, Admiral Kimmel went to interview Chief of Naval Operations Admiral King. King said that Admiral Kimmel could not have a copy of the proceedings and findings of the Naval Court of Inquiry and that Kimmel would not be permitted to even see a copy of the findings. King also said, amazingly, he had not read the Naval Court of Inquiry's report. Number 13, Kimmel was the only qualified flag officer not advanced under the Officer Personnel Act of 1947 because the Navy Department merely omitted the name of Kimmel from the list of flag officers whose promotion was authorized. That would be everyone else without any reference to his or anyone's performance. This constituted a belated special disciplinary action of a punitive kind taken without notice to the officer specifically singled out by such a mission Kimmel. The Chief of Naval Personnel, Admiral James Holloway, Jr., his 1954 memo to the Secretary of the Navy provided in pertinent part. The fact remains that an officer of over 40 years of honorable service to his country was summarily removed from his command and allowed to retire without being brought to trial for his alleged failure to carry out responsibilities entrusted to him. He continued, the records of the Bureau of Naval Personnel indicate that Kimmel's name was withheld from submission to President Truman. The records further indicate that Rear Admiral Kimmel is the only flag officer on the retired list who has not been advanced to the highest rank held on active duty. Admiral Holloway concluded with a recommendation for administrative action to remove injustice. The Chief of Naval Personnel respectfully submits that it would be a gracious act on the part of the nation to afford Rear Admiral Kimmel the privilege of advanced rank on the retired list. Number 14, 30 years ago, the Board for Correction of Naval Records committed error by refusing to hear the Kimmel matter thus denying Kimmel an early opportunity to remove injustice. In June 1987, the executive director of the Board for Correction of Naval Records refused to hear the merits of Admiral Kimmel's surviving sons' application for correction of military record in the case of their father and wrote in pertinent part that the relief requested of placing Rear Admiral Kimmel on the retired list as an admiral is not within the authority of the Board for Correction of Naval Records. Therefore, the case is being closed administratively. Members of the Washington High Command, among others, among others, committed perjury, suborned perjury, destroyed evidence, withheld evidence, and intimidated witnesses. For this reason alone, a compelling case can be made for administrative action to remove injustice in this case. Consider, on December 1st, 1941, Admiral Stark ordered the Commander-in-Chief of the Asiatic Fleet to implement President Roosevelt's three small ships order, knowing it was a setup 
to bait an incident, a causus belli, but he did not inform Kimmel then or ever. This is the three small ships order. The president, the president personally directs that the following be done as soon as possible. The commander in chief of the Asiatic fleet, Admiral Hart, later commented, risking personnel to no purpose whatsoever. Admiral Hart, gave President Roosevelt's order to Admiral Kemp Tolley to execute, never expecting to see him alive again. Tolley, at a 1971 luncheon with Admiral Hart and Admiral Hill, asked Admiral Hart, would you tell Admiral Harry Hill here if you think we were set up to bait an incident that causes belli? Admiral Hart, yes, I think you were bait, and I could prove it, but I won't, and don't you try either. In a letter from Admiral Hart to Kemp Talley in 1970, my relationships with Admiral Stark were close, and I did expect that he would someday begin to talk about the three small ships idea. He never did. I feel I should take the same attitude. I destroyed my record on the subject. Admiral Hart was Chief of Naval Operations Stark's counsel at the Naval Court of Inquiry. <clears throat> In 1958, the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, Clarence Cannon, from the well of the House of Representatives, accused Admiral Kimmel of failing to prevent World War II and the Cold War, because Kimmel and Short were not on speaking terms. When challenged by Kimmel, Chairman Cannon said he got this information after the attack in early 1942 from the FBI. When challenged by Kimmel, J. Edgar Hoover refused to confirm or deny this fact. This was the infamous lie that Kimmel tried to overcome the rest of his life. How's this for command influence? Senator Truman loudly perpetuated the infamous lie in 1944 and quietly recanted his allegation as president in 1945. Four days after the attack on Pearl Harbor begins the story of what I call the FBI's complete plans memo. Here's the memo. In pertinent part, Colonel John Ter Bush Bissell, the head of counterintelligence for military intelligence, the Army's military intelligence in Washington, D.C., today informed Special FBI Agent George C. Burton in the strictest of confidence and with a statement that if ever got out that he had disclosed his information, he would be fired. That about 10 days before the attack, Japanese intercepts were broken in Washington. These messages contain substantially the complete plans for the attack. They also contained a code word. A message was sent by Army Radio to Hawaii setting forth this entire plan for the information of the authorities in Hawaii. On Friday, December 5, 1941, the code words were intercepted, which indicated that the attack was to be on either Saturday or Sunday, and this information was sent to Hawaii. Mr. Hoover sent paraphrased versions of this memo to the president and to Judge Roberts. Here is Hoover's memo to Judge Roberts. In pertinent part, with, refer with reference to the memorandum that was left with you last night, I am in closing here with an additional memorandum which parallels the other memorandum. The enclosed memorandum is set forth 
in the form of investigative suggestions as to certain aspects of the situation in Hawaii. While the memorandum left with you last night was a narrative memorandum of the situation. The same material is covered in the enclosed memorandum with the exception that it is divided into what might be termed investigative suggestions. Notice that this memo is dated December 18, 1941 and refers to a second memorandum dated December 17, 1941 which has never surfaced to my knowledge. This is the pertinent paragraph from the pertinent page of the FBI's enclosed 12 December 16, 1941 memo, which clearly comes from the complete plans memo of December 11, 1941. <coughs> In more readable form, in more readable form, in 1941, Roberts identified Colonel Kendall Fiedler and his assistant, Lieutenant George McNell, as the officers charged with handling this information in Hawaii. That was the fourth investigative suggestion by J. Edgar Hoover. Identify the officer or officers charged with handling this information at a Y. Judge Roberts did that. He interrogated them using the information from the FBI's complete plans memo. But they knew nothing about the allegations. So, Judge Roberts merely dropped the matter, completely ignoring J. Edgar Hoover's investigative suggestions 1, 2, 3, and 5. That's in 1941. In 1946, Senator Ferguson of the Joint Congressional Committee had Judge Roberts as a witness under oath. Senator Ferguson wanted to know where Roberts got his information to interrogate Fiedler and Bicknell in 1941. Roberts did not reveal that he got the information from the FBI, from J. Edgar Hoover himself, nor did J. Edgar Hoover reveal this fact. In 1944, Attorney Rugg also wanted to know where Roberts got the information to question Kendall and Dick Nell. Roberts did not reveal that he got the information from the FBI. In 1944, General Short asked the Army Pearl Harbor Board to find out where Roberts got the information to question Kendall and Dick Nell. They did not do so. Both Kimmel and Short thought it was tragic that Roberts did not ask them about this. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much for your kind attention.